afternoon, everyone. How exciting to see everyone here. Thank you for coming to this presentation of my time as an ecumenical accompanier in uh, the West Bank. <laughs> I'm feeling a little nervous because this is not normally how I do up on this stage. Uh, to begin with, I just want to bring your attention. I, the souvenirs that I bought um, on this trip, some of them are here at the front of the sanctuary or at the right before the stage here, and you're free to come up after the presentation to look at them. Welcome, my name is Vicki McPhee, and um, I have entered, I entered into ministry, um, I, I felt my first call to ministry in 2003, while I was on a study exposure tour to Zambia as an adult participant, and over the years, I've led a number of trips and partic participated in a number of trips, uh, Mexico, uh, Zambia, India, um, and in 2012, uh, for a graduation present and my 40th birthday present, I went to, with my spouse, we went to Israel, Palestine. Um, after visiting Egypt and Jordan, we went on a United Church of Canada study exposure tour. And so that was our, our, my first visit to the state of Israel and to the West Bank. And that's when I first learned in 2012 about the ecumenical program of um, the ecumenical accompaniment program of Pal in Palestine and Israel. And so ever since then, I've wanted to look into being an ecumenical accompanier, and I kind of had to set it aside. I still had young children. And then in 2019, uh, I led a trip to Israel-Palestine with young adults, uh, two of whom were from this congregation, Matthew uh, Taylor Kerr and Eden Middleton. And I was reminded of the program. And so in March of 2022, when the church put out a call for uh, volunteers for the ecumenical program, um, knowing that uh, my children were uh, somewhat grown up and launched, my youngest was heading off to university, and my spouse agreed to keep my dogs alive. I applied for the program, and the program is uh, three months in length, so you can understand why the dogs needed, I needed some agreement that they'd be alive when I got home. Not only did he keep my dogs alive, he kept his daughter's bird alive. So all in all, he's the hero of this story. <laughs> And so, uh, so this brings me to having participated in the program and then now being here to share with you. Uh, and I want to say right off the top that there is no question that Israel uh, needs to be a state. Israel needs to have a, a, a nation state of its own. Uh, and along with being a nation state, as all of our nation states um, all over the world, we have responsibilities they have responsibilities not only to its citizens, but the people within its, what they claim to be their borders. And so, um, so bearing that in mind, um, I will let you know what the EAPPI program is all about, and then I'll tell you about my experience there. I'm going to take this off because it's warm, but this is my vest. I, I, I put it on mostly for Dave, because Dave Williams appreciates a good vest that has lots of pockets. And when I got my vest, I show, I, right away I thought of you. So it's got the, the Dove lo uh, logo on the front, and then the back is, um, says the name of our program. And we, whenever we were doing the work, we, we had to wear our vests. And we only could wear our vests if we were with a partner. We could never wear our vests if we were by ourselves. And so, and this is the only second time that I've worn this vest without long sleeves on. I feel a little, um, it feels a little uncomfortable to wear it showing my arms because where, we, where I was placed in Hebron is conservative. And um, let me tell you, nobody in Hebron knows that I have tattoos. They never would have seen me without my arms covered right to my wrists and my legs covered right to my ankles. So, uh, so it feels kind of weird to put it on and not have my arms covered. So as I said, the name of the, oh, I'm telling Chris to advance. Okay, so let's see what the next slide is. Okay, we'll just leave it here for a minute. So the whole program name is the Ecumenical Accompaniment Program in Israel and Palestine. And um, it was created by the World Council of Churches. And so I'll get to that in just a moment. So, so Israel, what we think of as Israel um, in this image is a 
all the yellow. And the orange part is on a map back in, um, 19, in the 40s, on a map where they were, they, the great they, were determining what land would belong to the state of Israel and what land from the um, British mandate would not be the state of Israel. It was, on a map, it was drawn in green. And so that's why it's been called the green line. Whenever you hear, oh, uh, Israel, if you hear something like uh, the green line borders or the green line agreement, it is, um, it, it has to do with the map, how it was created uh, back in the 40s as they were, uh, they were creating the state of Israel. Um, and so, it, in fact, it wasn't even a nation line, it was a demarcation line at the time because they were still trying to figure out what would make a state, what would make the state in that. And then in 1948, uh, as we all know, it was Israeli independence. And so um, that is when the state formally was created. Now, um, the Israelis celebrate the date um, as Independence Day, and the Palestinians, the people that lived in the area at the time and, there, and the people there now, they mark that day, they call it the Nakba, which means um, the catastrophe, because this was the time in which they had to leave, uh, anybody that was living within the Green Line area had to leave that, their homes and had to leave their land. And that, has, that is 75 years ago uh, this year. In 1967, there was a six-day war, and the occupation of the West Bank and Gaza began. And so Israel went from being contained um, within the Green Line to moving uh, right to the Jordan River, and which is why it's called the West Bank, because it's the, the, the land that is west of the River Jordan. And then they moved also into Gaza. And, so, and then the Golan Heights, but that's not a part of my talk today. And so they moved in and began that occupation. Um, I don't know what, I don't actually know what the next slide is, so let's go to the next slide. Okay, so we'll just hang here for a minute as well. So as I said, in 1948, people had to leave their land and leave their homes, and where did they go? They became refugees. Most recently, we're hearing the term refugee in regards to Ukraine. There's going to be some comparisons to this, so bear with me. But they became refugees because they were kicked out of their, out of their living area. And they moved into camps like this. This is um, Ida Camp in Bethlehem. And uh, the symbol of the key, um, this is the third time I've been to this camp. And the symbol of the key is the symbol of the right to return. A refugee has a right to return to their land or they have the right for compensation. And so the Palestinians who uh, were forced to leave their land or their homes have not yet been compensated and nor have they been permitted to return. They were told if you pack up what you can carry for maybe just like a month, we'll get things settled and then you'll be able to come back. And they, and they never, they have yet to have had that right. Um, given back to them. And so the key is why I, when I was in, uh, in the West Bank, I got a, a tattoo of a key, a skeleton key, because this key has meant a lot to me uh, since 2012 as a symbol of, of the refugee status. And so in regards to Ukraine, any Ukrainian refugee has a right to return to their country and if they can't, for some reason, they have the right to be compensated. This is by international law. So occupations. We are not unfamiliar with occupations. Japan was occupied. Germany, um, East Germany was occupied. Um, occupations have a tendency to run at about 10 years. We are now in year 56 of the occupation of the West Bank. Um, this Ida camp, before 1967, um, in, in this camp, there were 1,977 people uh, living. Now, if you give up your refugee status, you give up your right to return. And so people are not leaving the camp and they are continuing their lives. Um, and having children and such. And now in this camp, there are approximately 5,500 people, but no more land has been given. So it's a very crowded, dense area. I just saw Eden walk in, so um, if you, uh, Eden, I'm gonna out you here. Uh, if you ever wanna talk to uh, somebody from that young adult trip, Eden, um, I'm sure, remembers visiting Ida camp very much. So 
Under, can I go to the next slide, please, Chris? So under the uh, Fourth Geneva Convention, um, there are several rules of occupation, um, some of them being you can't do collective punishment. So if this side of the sanctuary got all rowdy and did something illegal, we can't punish the rest of you for what they did. You, you may not be punished for something you did not do. So if, um, if somebody on your block has been known to throw rocks or, or, or be, um, do something illegal, they can't come around to all the houses and make all the young men leave the houses and take them to jail. That's, that's just not permitted. Um, also, you can't remove people from outside the territory. Um, so this means when you arrest people or you take them into detention, you cannot move them out of the land um, in which they are living. And so we saw this with Ukraine. Um, Russia took prisoners and detained people, and then they moved them across the international border, and they moved them into Russia. It took only two weeks for the international community to impose sanctions on Russia for moving people across the border. This has yet to happen for prisoners that are being taken into the state of Israel from the West Bank. Um, the big jails and, and detention centers, most of them are on the other side of the green line. Um, you may not remove resources from the land. It's not your land. You're occupying it, but it's not your land. And so this is one of these um, bases, and, and I'm not talking about it today, but about the BDS movement, the Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions movement, it's based on the fact that if a settlement, which is in the West Bank, if a settlement of Israeli citizens makes something with product, like resources from that area and then sells it, that's an illegal removal of resources. So that's all I'm going to say about BDS. Um, we do not, the EAPPI program does not um, sanction, does not support BDS. Um, that is an individual conversation. So that's not a part of my uh, presentation, but that is where removal of resources, how it becomes a concern. And there can't be discrimination on the basis of race, nationality, religion, or political opinion. And so, um, I'll say more about this later, uh, what happens in the West Bank is that uh, there are settlements of Israeli citizens living there, and they are under Israeli civil law. Palestinians, who do not have citizenship, they are under military law. So, two boys doing the same thing. My first day in Hebron, I encountered rock throwing, which is like the most common um, activity that will, somebody will be arrested for. To my great shock, I was walking past a hill and this big rock came bounding down and almost hit me. I was startled because I was distracted by something else and the, we were doing handovers so the more experienced EA was with me and he yelled at me, he said, you stay here, I'm going up. He got his phone out and he started recording. He goes running up the hill and I was like, I'm not staying here. And I went up and followed him a little bit and it was an Israeli settler boy at about 12 years old and he was hucking rocks down the hill at Palestinian boys. The military at the checkpoint right there came running up the hill, basically kicked him in the butt and told him to go home. At the same time, Palestinian moms were coming out and going, shoo, 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 like go away to the Palestinian boys. Do not fight back. And they disappeared as well. Now, that boy should have been arrested, and he should have been uh, dealt with under civil law, but he wasn't, and I'll get to that later. If it had been reversed, if it had been a Palestinian boy throwing rocks at an Israeli citizen, well, any throwing rocks, they would have, he would have been taken, it's almost always a he, would have been taken by the military, he would have been detained, and he possibly, very possibly would have gone to jail, um, where they can hold him for uh, weeks and months on end without seeing their parents. And if they do see their parents, they only see them in a court setting. So there are two rules of law for the same crime, crime, um, depending on what, if you're a citizen of Israel or if you are a um, Palestinian. So that is, that is not allowed by the Fourth Geneva Convention. So right now, there are, in the West Bank, there are some 5 million Palestinians and some 500 
1,000 Israeli settlers. Settlers um, mostly come to the West Bank through, uh, by doing Aliyah. Aliyah means that they're immigrating home. If you have a Jewish, the minimum, required, qu minimum requirement to become Israeli is to have a Jewish grandfather. For any of you that understand Judaism, you know that's not how Judaism works. You are Jewish if your mother is Jewish. And that is the only way you can be Jewish unless you convert, is if your mother is Jewish. But when the state of Israel was created and they wanted to create um, a homeland for families and people, they needed, they wanted to broaden out the requirement of like the, 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 what was needed to be considered Jewish. And so they said, if you have one grandfather that is Jewish. You may commit aliyah and move to Israel and have all that the state of Israel affords to its citizens. And so that is mostly who's coming to the settlements because the houses are cheaper there. And so what happens is there, there's many Americans. I'm going to show you a Canadian later. Uh, there's many Americans. They're coming from Russia. They're not coming from Ukraine despite what's going on there, because Ukrainians can go elsewhere. Russians can't right now. So they are going to um, Israel, and in fact, they stay long enough to get their Israeli citizenship, and then they have freedom of movement where they would not necessarily if they were Russian citizens only. And they're coming from Ethiopia. So it's just a, a, a broad spectrum of people that are Israeli settlers, Israeli citizens, and they are given funding to for the first six months of living there to learn Hebrew so that they become uh, fully integrated into the society. And of course, if you're young enough, you be, enter into military service. Um, we had a chat with somebody who was from Florida who was like 21, and he was doing his military service after immigrating. Next slide, let's see what it is. Okay, so it doesn't work in this, like, and if we had full control of our house lights, this is when we'd pull them all down. But there's very, very few dots in the 1970 um, diagram and that this is the number of settlements and as you can see through the decades there are way more settlements in 2016 than there were in 1970 and then the, this is just showing the size of the of the settlements on the right the bigger the dot the bigger the settlement this is why and when you're looking at this picture on the right you can under this helps to understand why a two-state solution is no longer possible it is not possible, it was not possible for me to be able to go from Hebron to Ramallah, which is both in the West Bank, continu contiguously. I would have had to have gone through a checkpoint to get to Ramallah. It's not possible anymore just to carve out two separate contiguous bodies of land. And so the conversation that's happening now is, to the encouragement is to stop having leaders talk about two-state solution and start talking about what it means to share the land. The land um, is, cannot be broken up, and, um, and, and the only way going forward, if there's going to be non-Israeli citizens living in that area, is to figure out a way to share the land. Let's see what the next slide is. Okay, so EAPPI, this is a, this is a foundational uh, statement for them. We are not pro-Palestinian, we're not pro-Israeli, we are pro-human rights and international law. Um, in 2002, Christians, 2% 2 of the population in the West Bank um, are Palestinian Christians. And they uh, invited the world to come see what was happening, primarily at checkpoints in 2002. So the World Council of Churches created the EAPPI um, program, and the, it began as simply going and standing and looking or watching what was taking place at checkpoints. And over the years, it's expanded. I don't know what the next slide is, let's see. Okay, you can go back for a second, Chris, please. Um, thanks. So since uh, 2002, it's run um, continuously since 2002 with a two year break for COVID. And so it has evolved to monitor access to schools and places of worship. Uh, places of worship involve also churches. Today, I'm only going to be talking about mosques because that's where I was placed, but it involves um, uh, worship, uh, not only mosques, but uh, Christian churches. Uh, monitors access to land and livelihood. And there, are, in 2023, there are, uh, right now, there are two teams in Jerusalem, uh, and that's funded by the European Union, those two teams. Uh, there's a team in Bethlehem, 
and there's a team in Jericho, and there's a team in South Hebron Hills. Uh, the main city center is Yatta, and that's only eight kilometers from Hebron, and yet it's a whole different world. And then there's a team in Hebron, which is where I was placed, and Hebron is 30 kilometers south of Jerusalem. And so what uh, monitors do is they go watch, and if there's any um, contravention of international humanitarian law or human rights law, we write reports, and we send them to the World Council of Churches. And over the years, the World Council of Churches has been gathering data and such and giving it to um, organizations to help advocate for human rights, the end of human rights abuses in, in that area. Um, so as I said, there was a break in 2020, uh, February 2020 to January 2022, and um, let's see what let's see what the next slide is. Oh, and so I, I don't know if if it, I know some people saw the news over here. This woman is Sally Azar, the Reverend Sally Azar. She is the first female Palestinian ordained in the Lutheran Church. And she was ordained during my orientation in Jerusalem. And we were a part of like the celebration and it took over the whole old city and it was a lot of fun. And she came and preached at our handover ceremony. So when I was at beginning our formal time in Hebron. And uh, so, um, it was really, it was an exciting time because Lutherans from all over the world depended upon, descended upon the city and we had a great celebration. Also, the flip side of that while I was in the city was there were attacks on the Armenian quarter. Um, Armenians are Christian and so that's why I just want to bring up again and again, it's not just, it's not, it's, this isn't a Muslim issue, this is a Palestinian um, uh, human rights concern about Palestinians who could be Muslim, Christian, you're, you have to be of faith, so you're either Muslim or Christian. Next slide is. Okay, so, um, so I was posted in Hebron, and this is, um, I'm not wearing my, my vest because there are certain areas that we were not permitted to wear our vest. If we wore our vest, we'd likely be arrested and taken away, like taken out of the area, and so, uh, we do sneak attacks, right? We'd go in without our vest, but I had pamphlets that I handed out in Arabic, and I have some pamphlets here for you to see later. Um, but uh, the idea is, is if you're visibly international, then maybe um, somebody will not, may, maybe the tense situation could be mitigated, might be diffused if, if there was an international paying attention. And so this is, uh, I'm doing uh, monitoring of the mosque. This is the Ibrahimi Mosque um, in Hebron, and I'll tell you more about it in a minute. And everything was going fine then, so I said, okay, take my photo. And let's see what the next one is. Okay, so uh, EAPPI, we monitor human rights abuses for the UN and, and other organizations, and these are all photos that we took. This is from my time there. So that boy in the upper left corner, uh, that's at Salame checkpoint, and he has his wrist uh, zip tied together, and they, we never did find out why they held him, but they held him for about an hour or so. Uh, we, he looks like he's about 15 or so. And then we deter human rights abuses through protective presence. So this photo, I know you can't see very well. So we had to be sneaky sometimes in taking photos because we didn't want our cameras, we didn't want our phones taken away. So you'll see me, I always have a red bag <laughs> in the photos, but I'm right in the middle and I'm chatting with another, another um, she does tourism in Hebron. And then the fellow on, on the right, uh, he's Allah. He, uh, he's a, he lives just around the corner. And then there's Lars and, uh, and then a couple of other EAs. This was a really big day. We had, we, we, we had help that day because there was a big um, festival going on and we needed some help just to be able to keep track of everything. And what we're doing in this photo is we're waiting for the settler incursion into the market. And I'll tell you more about that in a minute. But um, so what we do is we'd stand with all the shopkeepers because things had a tendency to get broken when the incursion happened. And so all the goods that the uh, shopkeepers would have out would, could get damaged or people would get hurt. So we very visibly stood and uh, made ourselves known. And then we're in solidarity with local peace and human rights activists. And so this is my friend Lars. You can see in the left there, he's wearing the vest. Next to him is Amr. And Amr is a uh, photojournalist and he is 
um, I'm gonna have all this written for you on a slide, but he's one of the photographers for Eye on Palestine. And he just gets right in there with his camera. And so us standing next to him helps him push the boundaries a little bit further. And what you can't see very well is what they're looking at is a whole group of soldiers coming through the market. They're the advance guard for the uh, settlers that are about to follow. Um, and so they're coming through and they're gonna start uh, making everybody stop moving and to stand off to the side. Next slide, please. And then the final uh, thing that we do as EAs is we advocate for an end to the military occupation. And so this is the beginning of my advocacy. Um, this is the beginning of the work that I now do at home. Okay, so, I don't even, oh, I'm on time. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so I was, um, I was placed in El Khil, and I can't say the KH very well because I don't have the guttural, um, so I'm gonna do my best. But I was placed in El Khil, which is Hebron, and this is the only time <laughs> that I was able to get a photo of this sign, and it's the day I was leaving. And it was so early in the morning, and it was Ramadan, so nobody was on the road. And I said to the driver, stop, stop, stop. And I ran out to the middle of the road and got this photo. And so, as I said, Hebron is um, 30 kilometers south of um, Jerusalem. It would take a minimum of an hour and a half for me to get from Hebron to Jerusalem. A minimum, that was on a good day. Um, there were five of us placed in Hebron. There were 30 people all together that were in my group. It, we were group 87. Two people didn't make it into the state. They were deported, they weren't permitted in. And then two people, oh, with some drama, two people went home early. <laughs> And so, uh, so we were supposed to be 30, and we uh, ended with 26, and we were very proud as Team Hebron that we remained intact, that we didn't get to the point of wanting to murder each other so much that we did stay intact, and I think our photo is the next photo. Um, so, I was with um, three men and another woman, and uh, I have this picture um, on the table, but this is what we make up when we're leaving and we hand it out to all the shopkeepers and stuff and you'll see all the other groups. So see Team 84, 85, 86, and so, so here's Team 87. So Lars is on the left, he's from Switzerland. Ian is behind me wearing a cap. He is from Anglaterra. Anna Min, Anglaterra is, uh, I am from England. Um, Shirin, she looks Palestinian but she's Swedish, and she, her mom was born in uh, north of Israel, and what became a, her grandma was born in north Israel, and became a refugee and went to Lebanon, where she had a daughter. That daughter immigrated to Sweden and had Shirin. So because her mom was born outside of Palestine, that's why she was allowed in the country. She wouldn't have been permitted into the country if, her, if they could trace her mom, uh, just one generation back to the West Bank. And she spoke fluent Arabic. We lucked out like you would not believe, so that was awesome. And then we have Helga on the right. Helga's from Norway. He, um, he was in Hebron with, I'm gonna get it wrong, but it's something like temporary international police assistance. He's a police officer and it's called TIP, and he, People remembered him. Uh, TIP, TIP was the second last organization that was permitted to operate in Hebron to mitigate human rights abuses. EAPPI is the last. Uh, uh, TIP was kicked out a few years ago. Um, and he was also an EA in Bethlehem, so he had lots of knowledge of the, of the area and such. Next picture. Okay, oh, don't push play yet. Okay, so I just wanted to say, um, we all came with gifts and skills, and we had a lot of work to do outside of the house, but being in the house also required a lot of work. So my job um, in the house is, I kept the big board, I got a picture of it <laughs> to show you later, of where all of our, um, what our schedule was every day. We had nine days off, each of us had nine days off in the 90 days that we were there. And so we had to keep track, we had placement visits and stuff, so we always had to keep track of where people were and what they were doing. Um, and so I kept the big board um, accurate, and I did most of the grocery shopping and almost all of the cooking uh, for the family. 
Shireen uh, kept the kitchen spotless um, and organized, and she did some grocery shopping. And she, because she spoke Arabic, she was often our translator. We hired a translator when we needed a male translator, but she was often our translator. Ian, the fellow from England with the cap, he was the house husband. So he kept us flush with uh, gas, full gas tanks. He made sure that our uh, electricity was filled. That's another story. Um, and he would keep relations open with our landlord. Helga did all of the cleaning. He was an excellent, excellent cleaner, so much so that the new team asked me, he said, Vicki, where's the cleaning supplies? I'm like, I don't know. I don't clean. <laughs> I cook. <laughs> Go ask Helga. <laughs> and uh, Lars did all of our communication. So he, we had something like eight or ten um, WhatsApp groups uh, in trying to connect with all of our partner organizations, and he kept all of that organized. Um, and now, I'm just going to step to the side. This is about three minutes long. This is a video I made for my family to show our accommodations because they were quite curious as to where we were staying. The front door, we always have to lock it. And here's our living room. There's Lars. He's uh, got a sore back today, so he's trying to get his back fixed up. You'll note the two gas, one is a gas heater and one's an electric heater. We have to be careful that we don't overload our circuits. And I have my station set up right here. So that's our living room. And this is the men's bathroom. You don't need to see that. Here is our biggest nemesis so far, other than the electricity, is the drying rack. It is unbelievable how many times we've had to set it up. It normally goes out on the balcony, but it's raining today, and so it's living in our in our space, dining area. This is the big board, and all of our information, the big map on the wall of Hebron and H1 and H2, which are very important zones for us to know about. Contact information for the Dream Team, days off, littler map of the same to the left, and there's our big board that tells us what we're doing for the next month. Um, then we come into this big, big house, the flag of Palestine, which is illegal to fly outside. This is our kitchen. You'll note that the oven is not usable, I guess for two groups. So we're hopefully going to get it set up uh, this time. We have a microwave, but kind of afraid to use it due to the electrical issues that we're having. Washing machine. It says it's going to take an hour and 13 minutes. It'll probably take three hours. I don't know why. It just takes a long time. And then we go through here. Those are two bedrooms down there. Lars and Ian are sleeping in that bedroom. Ian's at the work computer trying to figure out EAPPI work stuff. You want to say hi, Ian? Hi. Hello. hello. And that space, the alcove, is Helga's room. Balcony. Hebron, and then this is Shreen's in my room. Oh dear, I didn't put my towel away. Sorry, Chris. I meant to do that before I started filming. Um, so this is my bedroom, my setup. There's my end table. Note, another heater in here. This is Shreen's setup over here. My end, another bit of end table. And then back here is our getting ready and our ensuite bathroom is back there and these are our um, clothes which was so nice to be able to finally unpack our suitcases and this is my cupboard and so trying to keep it neat and tidy and there's my duck I'm a diaconal minister in the United Church of Canada, and ducks are our symbol, so I brought a duck with me. Okay, so a little bit of history for Hebron. Let's go to the next slide, please. Oh, that's my big board. I'm just very proud of my big board. I just kept it color-coded and everything. All right, next <laughs> slide. And this is a photo of the family. So we're having, this is one of our last meals that we're having together. So, um, and you can tell this is later in the process because my hair is quite a bit longer in this photo. All right, next photo. Okay, so back to Hebron. So for those of you that remember or who were 
keeping track of the news when I went. Very soon after I arrived, there was um, an attack on the refugee camp of Janine, and that's when I started getting text messages from all y'all. <laughs> Like, are you okay? And it's like, yeah, I'm fine. Look how far north Janine is from Hebron. And then the um, clashes started in Hebron. So when something bad happens in one part of the West Bank, it, it flows through the whole West Bank and things uh, become volatile. So my home, the home that you saw, was way far away from where clashes would take place. It was a 25 minute walk and I was well within a secure zone and we had a security officer always checking in with us. So we were never, if we ever felt unsafe or in danger, we just got a hold of our security officer and asked for advice and we weren't allowed to leave Hebron without permission. Others, um, others left Hebron because, or left their placements because that was part of their uh, jobs, but all of our work was pretty much within the city of Hebron. Um, and so I have Hebron marked on the map. I used a poor color of arrow. It's yellow and more yellow. Uh, but I just wanted to point out where Janine is because right away, as soon as we got there, I actually thought we were going to be evacuated out. Uh, there was a, a day or two of really tenseness because there was people killed in Janine and then there was retribution killings and then, you know, and that just goes back and forth, you know, like, what is it? Like, you know, an eye for an eye, where does that end, right? Uh, too blind, you know, too blind people kind of thing and that's kind of this cycle was starting when we got there of course it was also happening that the um, protests were starting in the state of Israel Jerusalem and Tel Aviv primarily of the Israeli citizens protesting their own government and there was just so much happening and we just kept our heads down and just kept going to bed at night hoping things would be better the next day so uh, let's go to the next slide please this is the uh, Ibrahimi Mosque. This is why Christians uh, can go to Hebron without getting too much grief uh, crossing the border because we have a, because um, Abraham set up a, a tomb there for his wife, Sarah. And so we have the, it's a holy site for us. So we have, we can say we're going, going there when we visit. Um, now, there's, this is called the Tomb of the Matriarchs and Patriarchs. Abraham bought a tomb to lay Sarah in after she died. Abraham was called uh, the friend of God, and El Khayil means friend, and um, so that is why Hebron is named as it's named, is friend after Abraham. Um, so this Ibrahimi Mosque is um, after the Alaska Mosque in, and the Golden Dome Mosque in Jerusalem. This mosque is the most popular, the most reverent place uh, to go. And so like while I was there during, there was a um, Mirage as a big festival and Ramadan, thousands and thousands of people came to Hebron, uh, primarily from Turkey to worship at this mosque. And so um, it's, it's very, very um, sacred for the Muslim faith. But it is also sacred for Christianity and Judaism, and you'll notice a menorah at the top of the mosque um, in this corner. Um, in 1994, an American Jewish settler, who I will not name, um, lived, who lived in the nearby settlement Kiryat Arba, and he walked into the mosque during Friday prayer during Ramadan and opened fire on the men praying and killed 29 people and injured 125. As you can imagine, chaos ensued, and what happened immediately was the uh, Israeli military put all Palestinians in Hebron on lockdown for a month. They had to go to their homes and stay in their homes for a month. They were permitted just short periods of time to leave to get food. They couldn't go to work, and they couldn't go to school. You had to stay home. Israelis were not restricted from moving. Um, the Palestinians emerged after a month to discover that the city of Hebron, um, after years of living side by side with Israeli people, uh, settlers, um, it, it's not like it was, you know, perfect, but they were living together. They, they have stories about where they would celebrate birthdays together and they would um, celebrate of course, you wouldn't celebrate the other faith tradition event, but you would acknowledge it. They emerged after a month to find that checkpoints had been put in place and that restrictions on their movement um, suddenly became real, like be, was intense. And uh, what happened then is this mosque was physically divided and where it had been 100% mosque on the day of the shooting, when they emerged, they discovered that one third of the building was now mosque and two thirds of the building became a synagogue. 
And so now, not only are Israeli citizens, uh, settlers, living close by to them, they're now praying in the same building. Now, several times a year, the whole mosque, the whole building is turned over to uh, Muslims to pray in the whole building every Friday during Ramadan. But then during the Jewish significant high holy days, Passover, um, the mosque side is closed to Muslim prayer and is open for, uh, for the synagogue. Um, and there were, there, so there's increased, in strict, um, over time, over the 90s and uh, later 90s, there's increased restriction on Palestinians. And they created, a, the Israeli military created a security zone ostensibly to protect the settlers and allow them to move more freely among settlements. Within Hebron, like within a very small space, there's like three um, settlements in the community of a school that we monitor. They are living side by side. So it's not really settlements, but settlers living side by side. And then there's Kiryat Arba, which is, do you know the name Ben Gavir? Um, in the Israeli government. He is from Kiryat Arba. And um, one thing that I didn't mention is that in, uh, when people, when EAs returned to communities and were doing their incidents reporting, incidents um, between uh, 2019's reporting and 2022 reporting went up 70%. So uh, without protection without a protective presence, uh, there has been an emboldening of behavior, of harassment and such. And Ben Gavir being a neighbor, like very, like living just right across the road from Hebron, has emboldened the settlers there as well. And so um, the, the settlers can be quite aggressive, and it seems that they're getting more and more so. Um, in 1997, Hebron was formally divided, uh, you heard me say earlier, between H1 and H2. We lived in H1, in H is how Ian was at, H1. Um, we live there, it's a modern Palestinian city. It was, it had dress shops like you would not believe. There was food, it was lovely. There was a few Western style cafes. And then H2, which is the old city. Um, can we go to the next slide? I wonder what is, yes. So what you see here where it says H2 and then all these lines, this became H2. Within these lines, I could not wear my vest or I would be arrested um, or I would be detained. Um, you see where it says the mosque is the, the yellow in the bit and then the old souk is the market. And then Bet Romano um, in Tel Rameda, Bet Hasada, those are where uh, settlers are living. And then you see Kirat Arba, which is over to the right. Um, Kirat Arba is the um, model settlement it was one of the first settlements in, in the 70s to be created, and all other settlements are modeled after it. Um, and where I said that boy was arrested, it's the Al Salama um, checkpoint, checkpoint 160. This looks very confusing, and it, I don't expect you to understand it other than to know that our job required us to cover a lot of these locations, and we literally just walked in circles because we had to go through check, like we had to. Um, we always had to go through checkpoints and stuff. We couldn't go directly from here to here. Like if that's the mosque and I'm at uh, Al Salama checkpoint, you think I could just walk to the mosque? I couldn't. That was only, well, I could because I was international, but only Israeli citizens could do, or settlers could do that. Um, if you're a Palestinian, you had to walk around and, and circular around. And so uh, because, um, because the people that we were, um, often walking with weren't permitted to walk there. We didn't walk there. We wouldn't, we wouldn't leave them um, and then meet them. A consequence of dividing the city and putting in all the checkpoints, next photo please, is they shut down the bustling center of Hebron. This is called El, um, Shahada Street. There is not one single business open here. There were uh, like almost a thousand businesses on this street and, and some um, tributaries. The Palestinians woke up one day and all their shops were welded shut and whatever possessions they had in the shops were, they couldn't get. And, they, and this street was the place to go. It would be the vegetable market, everything. And, uh, and now it's the sterile street. And what it does is it offers as a buffer between uh, where Palestinians are permitted and where um, the uh, settlers have a school and a, and a synagogue and stuff. And so 
Um, so yeah, let's go to the next. Check. The, I think this is, so, so this is a, we went on breaking the silence. I don't know if you've heard of that, but it's Israeli military, former military. They tell stories of how they uh, saw human rights abuses or did uh, themselves at, when they were in the Israeli military. And so they took us on a tour and they have this photo and this is the same street. So you can see how busy it is. There's an Israeli soldier walking through the busy street, and the street behind, it's the exact same street, and is now dead. It's, there's nothing there. We were permitted to walk down that street because, again, we're internationals. Of course, we didn't wear our vests. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is, uh, we just see this posted around. Um, there is a, once a year, there's a demonstration to open Shahada Street, and I'll show you a picture from it later, the demonstration we watched. Okay, next photo. So the reason why we don't wear our vests is because of signs like this. You can't really see it the way that it is, but the picture, there's an image on the left. It is our dove. And it says, if you see somebody wearing this vest, call the police. They're supporters of BDS. And so we didn't wear our vests because we didn't want to get arrested. Um, and so this is right next to, you can see a fence in the top right. That's the school that we um, were monitoring all the time. So you can just see how close this all is. Um, and I will say I've had my passport photographed. Um, I wasn't detained, but um, it, it, it was challenging. Uh, settlers uh, were not happy when they saw us, and if, especially if we weren't very clearly being tourists, and they'd come take our photos. Uh, they would flip us the bird as they were driving by. They would go get this military to try and get the military to tell us, and we would sometimes have to move on. Uh, from where we were standing. They really didn't want us there. And the reason for that is, next photo. Oh, this is the slide. I thought I missed it. So yeah, like a 700% uh, increase between 2019 and 2022. So uh, an example of an incident is, next slide, is harassment. So you can Google caged house, caged home, Hebron, and you'll see this photo. Um, the man here at the bottom of the steps, we interviewed him like we had a family visit with him. We were not permitted to his home. He lives right next door to a settler. Somehow a settler bought the house next door. The role of the military is to allow settlers to live as if they don't live in a conflict zone. So when the settler bought the home, the first thing they did was shut down the street because nobody but the settler can drive on that street because they don't want a Palestinian car getting anywhere near the settler's house. The settler, the military does not arrest or chastise Israeli citizens. That's not their job. It's to protect them. So the family that lives on the other side of this house would walk by and throw rocks and break all their windows. So what this family has done is they've encaged their home so that their home doesn't get any damaged any further. And so, um, and, and there is no, you can complain, but who are you gonna complain to? Israeli police in Kirit Arba. You have to go into the settlement to file a police. So what they've done is you'll see a lot of these kind of cages over windows to protect the windows because that's one of the first things that they'll do um, if, uh, is the, 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 the encouragement to not be there anymore is to start breaking things. So I uh, went to another home, her name is Hannah, uh, during handover, and this fellow and Hannah's family have to have a family member in their home at all times. If they leave their home, the settlers are monitoring them, will then break into their home and take it over. And the military won't stop them. The military are there to protect them, not to police them. So now I, we couldn't go to the home, so we couldn't meet the wife. The son came and met us. And the only people that they're allowed to have visit are their uh, blood relatives, like their children, not the in-laws. So the children and the grandchildren, but not the son-in-laws or the daughters-in-law. Um, and I think I have the next picture is a synagogue. No. Oh, and um, so another example of a harassment is this. This happened, these, this, is, this was a panic time of getting a phone call and running, um, going through a checkpoint, and then getting here in time to see this. The woman that lives in this house, so you just, I'm going to tell about this checkpoint more than once. This is checkpoint 56. It's a big checkpoint. 
It's a scary checkpoint right here. This house is the first house in. Where I saw the kid throwing the rock is if I just turned around and the hill went up there, okay? She left her house, she went through the checkpoint, the vegetable market's right there, she was getting some vegetables. While she was gone, the soldiers came and welded that door shut. She comes back, her two children are inside crying, and it's welded shut. So we got there in time, and they're having this huge discussion. I'm trying to get as close as I can before my uh, partner pulls me back, because uh, I want my white face as close as possible to witness what's going on. He's taking photos. And finally, next photo, please. Uh, they were permitted to go get a saw and three extension cords. You know how long it takes to find three extension cords in that area? It took a long time. Uh, they went and got the extension cords, and they were permitted to saw open the door. And then uh, every, people went in and got the children and came out and showed the children to the public that had gathered. Uh, so this was written up as a report uh, because that is her home. That, like, that's her home, and they, they were um, dispossessing her of it. And so now that home, that door can't be sh locked shut. I don't know what they're going to do about it, but uh, we went and saw it later, and there's like 10 weld spots, burn spots on the door where they just, they just sealed it. Next photo. I just need to get my bearings. Okay, so I told you checkpoint 56 is a little bit scary checkpoint. It is right at the end of that road, like right down there. This is the end of the demonstration that we went to and people were starting to head home. You'll notice on that road, there's no vegetable carts, there are no women, there are no children. So I would walk from home, I would come down this road and right where that white car is, I would start to peer around the corner on any given day. If I saw children, if I saw vegetable carts, and if I saw women, it was good to go. I could go across that street and head to the old market. If the vegetable carts weren't there and you saw particularly young men and they were starting to cover their faces, turn around and went home. Or went to the vegetable market by coming up and going around. Um, I have gotten to know what a sound bomb sounds like a lot and it's a terrible noise, and they shoot them from the checkpoint, and it's a concussive noise to scare the bejeebers out of you, and it's to make you leave. And, and it just, I won't even tell you what I yelled out. Shirin made a joke one day of all the th different things I would say, all the different cusses that would come out of my mouth when I would hear the, the shot. Um, uh, live ammunition fire sounds different than a, than a sound bomb, and this is what I found out living in Hebron. Uh, so the clashes would take place down there, tires would be on fire. So if something was happening elsewhere in the West Bank, the people of Hebron would protest by coming down to checkpoint 56 and cause problems. And one of our rules was that we could never be near a clash. We had to leave. We could not intervene. We could not get in the way. Our job was to observe and to report, and we could not observe and report if we were hurt. And so one day we found ourselves in the middle of a clash and I was like, oh, we gotta get out of here. And, uh, but for the most part, we were, not near, we were not near danger or we knew how to get out of danger really quickly. So that was an incident, by the way, because the journalists, what you can't see, I also got to know really what journalists wearing press of the, um, you know, the bulletproof vests. It's like, oh, there's a journalist, that's not good. If a journalist, if, if the press were there, that they were there, they were anticipating something happening. Next slide. Um, so one of our tasks was to walk to Prayers Road. I'll explain that in a second, but Prayers, well, I'll t say now, Prayers Road was between Kirt Arbor and Palestinian businesses and homes. And settlers would come out, walk down the road to go pray at the mosque. So every Friday afternoon at about 4 p.m. when the sun was starting to set, we had to go walk Prayers Road and every Saturday morning because that's when they were going en masse to pray. And I just wanted to include this picture because sometimes the news that I'm telling you is heavy. This is some of the beauty of Hebron. And uh, we would walk to Prayers Road and this was the most open. I could get this a picture of this. Um, it's like metal, like it's done with metal uh, art. Anyways, okay, next photo. One of the things that we are keeping track of on Prayers Road that would be an incident is, so if you can imagine, Kiryat Arbor is here. It's a massive settlement here. This over here is another settlement up that hill. This is Palestinian. You're not allowed to drive 
uh, 60 permits only. There are only 60 people have uh, Palestinians that have permission to drive on this road. Otherwise, you're not allowed to drive. If it's a Jewish holiday and you're Palestinian, you're not allowed to drive on the road. So we would walk to the top of this hill to see if this synagogue was, looked any different than it does now. It's a tent, as you can see. There's a nicely built wooden staircase from this synagogue to that um, settlement. And once we saw the rabbi walking and he was surrounded with all these people, it was, it was actually would have made a nice photo if we were allowed closer. But what, they are, what we, our organization, is anticipating is they're then going to make some sort of walkway from the synagogue over to the, um, to the other settlement. This is uh, referred to as an outpost. And then they'll combine them, and then they'll say, no Palestinians near, allowed anywhere near that, because now it's all combined. The two settlements will be joined. And so we were going and monitoring whether there had been any additional building to this synagogue. And if there was, we would write an incident report. Next photo. Fun fact, the wall, which we didn't really encounter in uh, Hebron, is nine meters tall, one meter wide. And you know, there's always a hole at the top, that's for the crane to place, to hold on to the wall. We didn't see the wall in, um, in Hebron because we were well within the West Bank. The reason why um, Hebron is, a, uh, when, whenever you say to somebody, oh, I've been placed in Hebron, they go, oh. And that's because settlers and Palestinians are living side by side. It is a microcosm of the whole um, situation. Um, what's happening all over the West Bank is intensely taking place within um, a very small, um, area of this city. So, you know where you saw, where I showed you a picture of that yellow sign that said, call the police? It's just below, like that tree, it's just down there. So you see, we just walk around and around and around, we're all overlapped. This is, um, this picture doesn't do it justice, but this is Cordoba School. This was our number one priority. If we did nothing else in a day, we went to Cordoba. We went there at 7 a.m. We had to be there for 7. Our day started at 6.40, and we had to go back at lunchtime when they were excused. And we were making sure, so, see if you can imagine it, the children had to go, if they were out in H1, they had to go through checkpoint 56, which is a little scary. Then they had to carry down the road, and then they had to go up another checkpoint, checkpoint 55, which doesn't look scary, but, if, um, if your name is not on the list and you're a teacher, you're not going to be permitted through that checkpoint. So then you have to walk around. And I made a video to show the two options of getting back to checkpoint 56. But um, I was here a lot and uh, got to know the children. Uh, this was a, I, I think they went to like grade six or grade seven in this school. Um, I don't know what's next, Chris. Can you just show me? Oh, so there I am. You'll often see photos of me where my face isn't shown because um, we couldn't be identified while we were in country for fear that we would be identified when we we're leaving the country and not be permitted back in. Um, so we took lots of photos like this where you could see some of our vest and that. And I'm watching Checkpoint 56 and I'm also watching, there's an Israeli school right there. And the parents would come out and yell at the children or the teachers as they were leaving or coming. So I'm just keeping an eye on situation. Um, because I'm off of the street, we were allowed to wear our vests. Um, but anyway, so there I am. Next slide, please. Um, so there's checkpoint 55. And this is an incident because they're not permitted to leave. They were being held up. If you're delayed to, uh, to access worship or education by X number of minutes, you are not, it's a, it's a breach of your human rights. And so we would, as soon as we see this, we'd start timing. And then after five minutes, we would phone the ICRC, which is the International Red Cross Society. They would uh, do some uh, phone calls as well. And we would just get closer and closer so they could see that they were being observed. Um, but that's checkpoint 55. The reason why it's a big deal to go out is because that's the secure zone on the other side of that um, checkpoint. And you can see a settler vehicle just down below. Next slide, please. So this, this is just another photo of, of that checkpoint, and there's the Israeli school just right across from it. Um, you know, this is Tal Ramada. This is the area of Tal Ramada, and as I said, those two people's houses where they're locked down, 
they have to carry all their groceries by hand because they're not allowed to have a vehicle. They don't have people coming. They can't have people come and do repairs on their home because people are afraid. The soldiers are, like, they're afraid of interacting with the military. Like, th their lives are really, really narrow. And this is another deterrent, is to have to go through this checkpoint twice every day. Next slide. That's just the school that I just, yeah, there's, and there's the parents are dropping kids off and such. Next slide. I was often paired with Ian in the early morning for some reason, I don't know why, but um, one of the girls gave us flowers, and so that was a nice day, yeah. You'll see how many layers we're wearing, um, and that neck scarf, I wore that neck scarf all the time. It was cold. The month of February was pouring rain and cold. I I'd, I'd text my friends, and I'm like, oh, it's a three-layer day today. It's going to feel good. Uh, I often have seven layers on. So next slide. Okay, so I made this video. So you have a choice of going um, out checkpoint 55. We'd have to show our passports. We tried not to interact with uh, soldiers if we could help it. So we would go cross country, which is how others would go if they weren't permitted through the checkpoint. And this is going to show you that the checkpoint is BS because <laughs> you can get around it. It's only secure in that they just want to slow you down and, and, and take up your time. So, um, oh, there's, I'm talking for the first little bit and then I'll narrate the other. Good morning. We are just, Ian and I are just wrapping up our time monitoring the checkpoint, checkpoint 55 at Cordoba School. And so our options now are to walk down the path that I'm about to walk and turn right and exit checkpoint 55, at which we would probably have to show our passports and we can't wear our vests. Um, or the other option is to go the slightly longer way. And so uh, let's see what that looks like. I learned how to do all of this while I was there. I'm just, I was very impressed. So there's checkpoint 55 and the soldiers in the booth. And then uh, there's a little kindergarten over to our right. And so we'd always wave to the kids playing. And then, um, so this is the reason why I went at this time in my life, because my knees and my ankles are still good. Uh, so Ian loved this orchard. He would always stop here. Um, he knew he was making the video, so I hustled him along. But he would always want to stop and admire the view. He just loved this orchard. And so you see all the old olive trees. And that woman Hannah I told you about lives just down the path. And now I have to catch up to him because he just kept walking. And so, like, this isn't a formal road or formal path. Um, and it would take about another 10 minutes to get to our destination. And our goal here is to get to checkpoint 56 and exit the secure zone and to go back into um, H1 and, and go over to the market. Um, so because we're going through checkpoint 56, we had to take off our vests. Um, and so, um, like, I lost items in this whole procedure. We were always on and off with our vests. Um, so, and then he's about to turn around and he's going to say, there's a soldier. And I was like, this is where the boy was throwing rocks down this hill. And I was like, all like, it doesn't matter if there's a soldier, I'm brave. And then I got around the corner and I'm like, I'm not brave. I don't want my phone to be taken away from me. So I, so I just shut it off. You can see him coming up the hill. But this is where I saw the boy throwing the rock down the hill and, and more rocks came. And this is, um, this had, had now been paved, but that had been, had a lot of, um, gravel and stuff before. Um, is there and then the girls saying goodbye. We developed relationships with these children and we, we weren't allowed to, you know, you're not allowed to initiate contact. But this one girl, she's about uh, 12 years old, she knew just enough English that we could communicate. And I told her it was my last day. It's our last day, we're not gonna come back. And she just looked at me and you just know when somebody's gonna come in for a hug. And she just came and gave me a big hug because she was so sad that we were leaving. We developed like really great um, connections while we were there. Okay, the other thing that we do is we monitor access to worship. Okay, so, oh, we would come out 56. So, so that soldier was walking up from 56. I turn around the corner and you can see why I say it's scary, right? Um, what you can't see really well in this uh, photo is on the right side just above is an air gun that would shoot out um, rubber bullets. Rubber bullets aren't small, they're big. Um, and they were, they, they would practice 
every once in a while they shut down the area and practice. And um, we've, like, we've been denied going through there. Uh, like, so we'd have to go around. We'd have to go take a taxi and go around. Because there's always a workaround. That's what's dumb about all of this. There's a workaround. We just couldn't take the more efficient route. Whenever we came out of this in the morning, this is who was waiting for us. Next slide. T-shirt guy. He worked up the street, and he'd see us, and he'd be like, and he'd run over. He'd get coffee from a vendor, and he'd come running over, and he'd say, marhaba, you know, good morning. Um, and, and he didn't speak any English. And we'd just nod, and, you know, and he'd say, welcome, you know. And, and we'd say, I would say, kifak, like, how are you? And he'd say, I'm Dilia. And he'd say, kifak, how are you? And I'd say, I'm Dilia. And that's, <laughs> that was the extent of, you know, whenever Shireen wasn't with us. But this man was so kind and so generous. And uh, his name is Mohammed, but... There are so many Mohammeds. So we refer to him as T-shirt guy because regardless of the weather, I don't know if you saw how many layers I was wearing, he's wearing a T-shirt. So next photo. Oh, um, this is another. Somebody asked me once, what was your scariest moment in 90 days? This was my scariest moment. Ian and I were standing on the path. All of a sudden, the gate in 55 slams open, and six fully equipped soldiers come running up the stairs. There's no children around, nothing. It's just he and I, we were almost done. And I just about fainted. I just, all of a sudden there, as you can imagine, six fully armed soldiers are running towards you. And I was doing a mental assessment of what I had on me that they were gonna take away from me. And I was like, okay, no, my notebook is okay. I ripped out the pages yesterday. Um, they're gonna get my phone, but that's okay. And I was just talking to myself and they came running past us and then they went to the school and they stood outside the school for a little while and then they walked back and then if you could believe it one of those soldiers had the nerve to wave at me as he was walking by but I, we don't know exactly what happened but they I think they were looking for someone because I saw them later in the day um, detaining a teenager and taking him into the secure zone please um, so Access to worship, this is during one of the, the Festival of Mirage that I was telling you about. Uh, we weren't allowed to wear our vests in this area, and I think I was the only white person in the area for all these thousands of people that were arriving for worship, so I was a superstar that day. <laughs> I got my photo taken again and again and again. All these young women, are like they'd see me and they'd rush over, and yeah. So Sharin, she, she didn't ask to get her photo taken because she blends in with everybody, but I, was, I stood out like a sore thumb. <laughs> Uh, so there's the, there's the entrance to the mosque just up the way. Next photo, please. So this is Ibrahimi Mosque, as I told you about. There's the entrance, the first entrance. It's actually a checkpoint. It's not really an entrance. You have to go up the hill. Um, this down below is a potential violation. They're asking, they were asking all the men to lift their shirts to show the waistbands, and that's not right. Um, this is inside the market. So if you look in the photo up top to the left, um, people are going through this checkpoint to emerge out over here. And, um, and the gate is shut here. They're not letting people through. Um, and you can, I've been in that cage of waiting to go through the checkpoint. Um, and as it gets closer and closer to the time of prayer, people get really agitated, like I just about got bowled over once um, going through there. So this is something that we do every Friday near noon. And then uh, Ramadan, we, uh, we would do it more than once uh, during, the, during the week, but uh, this was our Friday activity. Next slide, please. Okay, so first Friday of Ramadan was amazing. We went, not knowing what was going to happen. And uh, in fact, the ICRC were there and the, the, there was no problem of people moving through the checkpoints. So we just went in. And there's a long, a long ramp that you saw that I was getting my photo taken. Thousands of people were there. The mosque had reached capacity. Thousands of people can fit in that mosque. So they went, they were shepherding people into the garden. The garden reached capacity. So they filled that ramp and, um, I, I, we were just standing waiting and all of a sudden, some magical moment <laughs> when all the men know that it's time to pray and they all stand up and all of a sudden we're in lines. I don't think I should have actually been there. There's me and one other woman there and it was like, I don't know. But the men, the women's side wasn't at capacity so it was all men. We're all in rows. I did a quick count. I think there were over a thousand people all lined up and they started to pray. And we just found ourselves all of a sudden in, in this prayer that we weren't planning to be there, so we didn't know what to do. So we just made, like when people bow down, we 
crouched. We didn't, you know, we were clearly not participating, but we just didn't want to be sticking out too much. I made a really quick video so you can just see. And there was a bunch of soldiers um, up in that stairway there. So there are children and men here, and this video actually goes on much longer, and I have the call and the response. Um, I've talked about this in worship, uh, one of my sermons, and this moment, like, I still get hair raised on my arms of this moment of being permitted to be there in this very, um, like, it, like it's liminal space, like God was there. And it just was like, it just felt so, it was such a beautiful moment. Um, yeah, so uh, this, this was the first Friday of Ramadan and we didn't get to stay for the whole of Ramadan, but that was the most amount of people I had seen in the area up until then. Okay, so this is um, the checkpoints you have to go through. This is me on my way <laughs> to Jerusalem on Easter Sunday morning. I had prayed for 45 minutes from the time I left Hebron to when I got to Bethlehem because all of the checkpoints had been sealed. They had all been shut. No Palestinian was permitted to go through a checkpoint. Checkpoint 55, checkpoint 56, checkpoint 300 at Bethlehem, which is one of the largest checkpoints, because it was Passover. And um, it was such a massive, like a, a high holy day, so no movement allowed. And I was praying on that Easter Sunday that my international passport would get me through the checkpoint. And this is me, you don't see, I am crying. <laughs> I am so happy because the buses were running and I get on and it was all uh, white people and nuns. And I was like, the Lord is risen, the Lord is risen indeed. <laughs> it was, I was so excited because I really needed the day off and I didn't want to get turned around and have to go home. Um, what's the next photo? Okay, so back at the mosque. Um, on the high days, high holy days, whether it was Muslim or Jewish holidays, they divided the walkway, so the ramp is up to the mosque, it's just right here, and so as you can see on the right, there's Jewish people, Israelis were um, walking on that side, and Palestinians would walk on the other, and nobody in between. Next photo. Um, and it's just as likely, so here's Sharin, and I think she's making this dude nervous. So this is an Israeli settler. You'll see he has the cords hanging down from his clothing and he's got the hat. What you can't see in this photo because he's wearing a black suit is his machine gun that he has across his back. And that's like just at its back. And this is just further along the same street. So any, any settler can walk around with a gun and uh, there is no worry about concealing it, you just have it openly carrying it with you. And so, so he's a little bit worried about Sharin here, and, uh, and he's walking with his family. You see his wife there on the left and his two children. So this is right next to the mosque. Okay, so now we're at the, at the market, and uh, if, you, if you could imagine, we, if, if you just pretty much went... Um, I'm just trying to think, from where the photo's being taken, is a settlement and then Cordoba School. Like, it's all close by. And so this is our team with Mudasem. He's our translator that we would hire. Next photo. Um, this is on that walk, the prayers road walk that I was telling you. This is me walking all the way back to the mosque. And um, I was just visiting with the little girls. I, le I learned how to say Kadesh Umrek, which is how old are you? And then we tell each other how old we were. And yeah, I learned how to say that I'm a priest in a church, you know, so that they knew. Yeah. Uh, next photo. Um, so this is Zugbi Zugbi on the left. He is from Wiam. He's a Christian Palestinian who leads tours of Israel, Palestine. Um, and uh, I would highly recommend that organization if you're looking for a tour of the area. The woman in the middle, her name is Tivan, and she is from the United Church of Canada office. Um, this is the day after I returned to work of having COVID. I was out of work for eight days having COVID, and she was just amazed because all the shopkeepers were hugging me. You know that feeling of you, you know you belong when you've been missed, 
right? And I, 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 again, I felt like a superstar walking through the, the shops or, or the, the souk and everybody's hugging me because they knew I had been really sick. And, but T-Van was visiting from Canada and I had just toured her around and she brought me Tim Horton's tea. <laughs> she gave, brought uh, Earl Grey tea for me. Next photo. So, um, so this woman on the right is one of the shopkeepers on that prayers road. We actually... Um, intervened. We didn't intervene. We stood in her doorway as a bunch of settlers came down the road and they were like, they were young boys. We were teenagers. We were a little bit worried about them. And the military walked up and, and kind of diverted them. But we stood in her doorway so that they couldn't come in. Um, she's very pleased here because she's just finished her order for Ramadan. She was getting ready for Ramadan. And then this is Layla on the, on the left. She's the only female shopkeeper in the souk. And she sells, um, all, all the things that she sells are made by women in Hebron, all the products. Uh, access to livelihood, this is the Tukimia checkpoint. We had to get up once a month at 3 a.m. to be here for 4 a.m. open um, and spend two hours. Uh, the work week is Sunday through Thursday. On a Sunday morning, 10,000 people primarily men, go through this checkpoint. The rest of the week, not so many because some will stay in the, in the state of Israel. They'll have apartments or they'll stay with people and, and they'll go to work. Um, so our job is to count how many go through. Your thumb gets really sore doing the clicker. And then to talk to the people whose permits were rejected um, and, and to count. Um, next photo, please. This morning, um, there was a problem inside of all the gates that normally are open, only one was open. So all of these men, we're going to be late for work and their jobs were at risk because they're not near Jerusalem at this point. They still have to get onto a bus or a, or a service on the other side. And so this was, this was just heartbreaking to watch. And, and just know that that checkpoint is massive. There are thousands of people inside that checkpoint and you can see all the people outside. Uh, this, this guy is Gandhi. And you can see Shirin in the back there, she's enjoying a juice. He runs a juice stand and then during Ramadan, he presses juice ahead of time and sells it in bottles because you can't eat or drink during the daytime. Um, and his home, right where Shireen is, right behind her is the doorway up to his home. I don't think I included any photos, but an incident that we had to report where settlers walked on his roof and threw garbage and rocks down into his open staircase to uh, wreck his lights that he had put up for Ramadan. Um, and they do that every Saturday. And so, um, so we, would go, we would go and uh, write a report. He's 28, he has a two-year-old and another one on the way. Next slide, please. Oh, this is the Sandman. Watch how this guy makes his little camels. I took a video of it. Okay. Now I add some of black sand with the pipe. I enter inside the potel like that. Now this black color changed to camel. The tools that I use, the wire with the pipe. This is all of my tools. Uh -huh. With the wire, I make the legs and the tail of the camel. <laughs> I know, it's amazing. You know, the legs and the tail are ready. Now I cover the black sand with the yellow sand, the same background color that I put it before, right? And I start pushing the sand to make the hump of the camel, the make the head upside of the camel. It's like magic! Yep. <gasps> we have a camel. The camel is very in. nice. So that's the Sandman. We'd stop and have coffee. You can see him sitting in his little uh, alcove there. And that old guy in the corner, he sold vegetables and we'd always buy vegetables from him. Next, oh, this is my favorite cat. There's cats everywhere. I love this cat because it was like black on one side and black face. And then, anyway, I just wanted to show you my cat. 
Okay, next photo. So this is the vegetable market, and then uh, upper left is the vegetable market. Here is inside the souk, inside the old market. And then the bottom left is this, this guy selling. You can see up in the upper left, you can see I'm right beside that big thing of uh, tomatoes uh, as we're walking through the market. And this is Shirin talking to her father-in-law. This, this old guy wanted her to marry his grandson. And so every time she saw him, she would sit and talk to her father-in-law, she called him. Next photo. Okay, so the market, um, Eden and Christopher remember this very well. The market is covered with gating and um, netting because settlers live all around the area and they throw stuff into the market. So you can see the broken chair. You can see the bottle filled with yellow liquid. It is urine. Um, and so all of this has been covered. It used to be just a complete open air kind of um, market, but they have to cover it with these awnings to not be injured by the stuff that gets thrown. Next photo, please. So this is, um, uh, this is the beginning of the old market. These soldiers are all, um, they have just come out and they're securing the area ready for the settler incursion. We had to do this every Saturday afternoon. Um, there is some reason, some holy reason that Jewish people need to come see something in the market. Well, I wasn't able to establish what holy site was in the market that they could come in, but it's not safe. If you've ever been to the area, you'll know when you enter certain areas of the uh, area C, it'll say, Israeli citizens, it is not safe, do not enter. I don't know why settlements get created in an area that is do not safe, do not enter, but they do. And this is one of these areas that it's not safe. We would be warned by the soldiers as we'd be coming into this area, you got to be careful, you're not, you're not safe. And we would mutter under our breath, it's like, they're not the ones holding you know, military, you know, machine guns. Um, so they're, they're the advance guard, they're coming out and they're uh, making everybody go to the side and pull off so the settlers could come through. The largest group that we saw had about 80 settlers, uh, babies, like toddlers, right up to, you know, older people. And all life has to, all Palestinian life has to be suspended as they move through the market. Next photo. So this is Batter, he owns a shop right across from that big gate, and uh, <laughs> that guy right behind him with the little cap on his head, he owns the shop right next to him. And actually, this is the commander apologizing to Batter because he had been told to close his shop um, for a random reason, and Batter had said, no, I'm not closing, and they were starting to really harass him, and the commander came over and said, no, you're right, you don't have to close. And so, but you can tell one of the EAs is inside the shop taking this photo, because they were standing next to him. Next photo. Um, so this is them coming out, a closer photo, you can see all the gear that they have on. This was scary the first time. I, I'm, I'm not gonna lie, it's, it, it did take a little bit of getting used to to have a fully armed uh, military person with his finger on the um, trigger right next to me. It, it, was, it was weird. Next photo, my heart would always beat. This is a putz, I just wanted to show this photo. This guy, this guy, he's from Montreal. Like, we would get text messages, your Canadian's here, ah, he's not our Canadian. Um, so, one of the rules, and you can see Ian, he is just turning away from the camera there. Um, this is I on Palestine, this is how we got this photo. Um, but he would always try talking to Lars. And you know, it just didn't serve us well to talk to the military or to the settlers because the Palestinians who didn't always speak English would think that we were friends. And so it was kind of awkward when he would come up and treat us like long lost friends from Canada. All right, next photo. Um, and so this is them walking in front of Batter's shop. Um, and so this is, uh, I don't know if it's Sharin's passport or mine on the left. So this guy's got our passport. And, and these are the settlers just walking through. Um, they, would, they would jeer and they would, they would be like, hey, you wanna get my photo? Can I get your photo? And they try and get our photos. Like it was so awkward, it was so uncomfortable. Next photo. Um, so there's Sharin, and she, that's her PO'd face, like she was mad. Um, and so these are just settlers moving through the area, and um, yeah, it, we're all just waiting for them to pass through. Next photo, please. 
um, show this photo because you see this female soldier. Those are all tear gas canisters on her chest. And he's got the tear gas deploy like gun. And then here's the spent cartridges down here. And there, it's not an unfamiliar thing in this area. Next photo. Um, just more, just more. This was every Saturday. We were there 13 weeks. Next photo. Oh, okay, so now, let's take a breath. Um, so part of my responsibility is to uh, advocate, to be an advocate, and so I went to the Canadian Embassy. It did nothing, <laughs> but I got to talk to somebody, um, and I was just so proud of myself, because Christopher, not only did I make it on time, I was an hour early. I was so proud of myself. This is in Tel Aviv. It took all day to get there, but I, I got there, and I was on time. I asked the guy, um, so what is Canada's role in the peace process? And he said, basically none. We don't have, we do not have the expertise. And I said, so why won't Canada acknowledge that it's apartheid? And he said, oh, because the legal definition of apartheid is anti-Semitic. And I said, okay, show me, tell me about that. He said, I can't, I don't have it. I said, you don't have it? He's like, I said, how am I going to get it? And he's like, you go through all the parliamentarian minutes from Canada and you can find the legal definition. Anyway, it was, it was frustrating because I was willing to learn. I wanted to have an honest and open conversation and he just tossed it down the road. So next photo. Um, so placement visits. Uh, we're allowed to do two placement visits. I requested to not be put into the rural area. So that meant Yatta and Jericho. I didn't want to go there. And the reason why was because of this. Now, they, in pictures, they look really nice. They are so stinky in real life. You have to do a lot of shepherding um, when you're in the area. But the real reason why I didn't want to go is because settlers um, coming down from this hill, you can't see it in this photo, but a settler coming down from this hill will uh, bring sticks with them and will break the legs of Palestinian sheep. And I don't ever want to see that. Um, so, or kill them outright. Um, a, an American woman who was in the area um, when a, a settler came by with one of those big sticks, um, he, he actually um, fractured her skull. And this is, a, this is a, an American citizen, a white American citizen. It's not, she wasn't confused as being a Palestinian. So I didn't want to be in that area, but I went to Yada for a, um, a couple of days and got to go shepherding. Um, next photo. I also, oh, and this, this is another reason why I didn't want, didn't want to go. It's like serious desert. And, and, the, and the communities are far and few in between. This, this whole area is now under a closed military zone. I actually was worried whether my feet would set off any alarms at the um, airport when I was leaving because um, they're fire, it's a firing zone. And if there's um, gunpowder around and I've walked on it with my shoes, I was carrying it. Um, so I threw those shoes out, and I didn't have to worry about it. But um, there are a massive amount of home de demolition orders happening. So what they have said is they're going to set up a, um, a like a practice. I don't know what you call it in the military, like where they can do um, practice maneuvers, right? So they close the area because we're going to do maneuvers, and it's not safe. We're going to demolish your homes. We're going to move you out because we're doing maneuvers. Um, oh. This person's going to move in with their RV right here. It's okay. The settler's just going to move. It's just one. And then suddenly there's another, and there's another. And then suddenly, you know, it's not a firing zone. It's not a closed military zone anymore. It is now a settlement. This is how this works. So this area is under intense pressure. Um, all these people are going to lose their homes over the next few years. They're just going to be demolished. Although you can't see any in this photo because I was so amazed by how empty it looked. Okay, next photo. I also went to Bethlehem. This is Sharin, and I forget her last name right off the top, but she was killed just over a year ago, a uh, Palestinian press. Um, she was shot in the head uh, by the Israeli Defense Forces. So this is in Bethlehem. Um, next photo, and George Floyd is also there. There you see. Uh, next photo. Um, I'm almost done. We're almost there. Uh, 
in Bethlehem as part of my placement visit, I went and watched a girls' soccer team, football team uh, practice. They weren't doing any running around because it was Ramadan, so they were just doing practice kicking and stuff. And uh, so there's the wall. They're that close to the wall. This is in Camp Ida that I showed you earlier. And uh, it was just a beautiful, serene moment. The sun was just right. And it was just, it was, it was, if you could ignore that that is a separation barrier, it was actually a, a very pleasant little moment. Next photo. Okay, and then we went to a school on the other side of Bethlehem. I was told uh, when we arrived at the school to take off my vest, and I said, okay, took off my vest, pardon me, took off my vest, got outside, and the other EA uh, that's placed in Bethlehem said, um, 10 years ago, there was a settler um, came down from that hill and saw the EAs with their vests on, phoned the military or the police or whatever, military showed up um, and escorted the two EAs directly to the airport and they were immediately deported. So we don't wear our vests at that school because <laughs> we don't want to get deported. So this school is, uh, had been, uh, um, it has a demolition order because it has improper electricity, but they can't get a building permit, you know? So it's just one of these chicken and egg things. So next photo, uh, there is a settlement not very far away and the Palestinians have put all this garbage on the road because settlers used to drive down the road. This is right beside the school, would drive down the road and do things to the schoolyard and to the school. So now the settlers can no longer drive down this road. That's how they're managing the situation. Uh, we have two educational days. One of my days I went to military court watch. I've already told you a lot of this, but uh, the role of the military is to allow people to live as if they don't live in a conflict zone. 97% uh, uh, of children detained live within one kilometer of a settlement. This organization follows children through the detainment system, like being detained, and we got to go to the court and see two um, uh, families deal with uh, accusations of the child throwing rocks. That's the most common accusation, um, and I've already explained the difference. Settlers have civil law and Palestinians are under military law. How they get the children to um, comply and say that they're guilty uh, so they don't have to wait six months in jail for a trial. Um, you can detain a child as young as 12 um, uh, under military law. Um, they'll get the child to or to narc on their uh, friends is by saying, if you don't tell us, we're gonna remove, we're gonna cancel your father's work permit. So work permits to go into the state of Israel are only ever given in three month periods, time frames. So they're always under threat of them being revoked the next time. And so they use the permit system to really play um, people off one another. And it would be easier to say, yes, I threw rocks, and to get out in a month, then it was to say, well, no, I didn't throw rocks. Okay, your trial date's been set for six months from now, and you don't even know if you'll be able to go home after then. It, is, it has been proven that children do not become radical, boys, because it's almost always boys, do not become radicalized by being jailed. The, 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 what they're do, trying to do is to defeat them, to make them compliant and not fight back how uh, the, the radicalization comes from when a family member is killed. So when you see these retribution things happening, it's really, you know that that's causing down the line even more. And, and they know this, the stats are there, and it's still, they're still doing it. So uh, like Janine, like, you know, what, what the down the road outcome of what happened in Janine at the end of, January is, is going to create even more radicals, right? Um, yeah. Um, okay, I won't tell you. The, there, there are stories from that court watch. I can tell you one-on-one -on -one later. Uh, next photo. These two women. Okay, so I've talked a lot about Palestine. I've talked a lot about um, uh, Palestinian issues. A great deal of our orientation and our midterm orientation were, in fact, with Israeli organizations. Israeli um, people telling us about um, the 
like the whole how different groups of different types of Israeli people have come together to create this society that matters. The people that are um, Haredi Jews, you know, the ones with the big hats, like the big hats and such, they don't actually believe that settlements should be happening. They're against settlements. Um, and so <clears throat> society is made up of a, a lot of different opinions pardon me, opinions and such. Um, and we learned, we heard from many different organizations that are Israeli-centered. And one of the organizations was New Profile. And these two women told us about their um, refusal to enter the military when they turned 18 and how they are working to demilitarize society. Israeli children, from the moment they are born, they see guns all around them. They see people that are protecting them all the time. And if you need protecting, there must be something you need protecting from. And what, what they are taught, and, and, and I, we talked to people in the midterm training, Israelis who said, well, if only the Palestinians won't teach their children to murder every Jew that they find, we would live side by side with them. And we'd be like, what? Well, you know, in school, they teach them to shoot any Jew that they come across. I'm like, no, no, I don't think that's true. But that's the narrative. Some, I'm, I'm not doing a, I'm not painting a wide brush, but that's what this person, she says she lives in fear every day of her life that, that she will be attacked and murdered. So, so they, these women are working to um, have it recognized that we live in a, they live in a militarized society. Next photo, please. Um, and I'm just about at the end. This is Zidane. You'll see his left eye is closed. He lost his left eye and he lost most of his teeth. This is checkpoint 56. He lives just on the other side. He was working in Israel and he needed a sledgehammer for work. Um, soldier saw him with a sledgehammer, came over and took it from him and beat him with it. Um, he runs Human Rights Defenders. It's an organization whose office is just right here. And what they are doing is they're teaching teenagers to film any incident that, that might involve a human rights violation. And the, and the more video that they can get, um, the, they're hoping that they can start advocating for themselves and say, we literally have proof that we didn't throw a rock or that we didn't fight back or what have you. So that's, that's one of the things that he does. Next photo. This is bragging. Um, so Zidane and, oh, I, I, his name just went out of my head. They, you can't see in the photo, but that photo is a plaque. That, that what I'm holding is a plaque. And it says, thank you for your work, EAPPI and Team 87. So the team said that I was the one who was going to receive it, so I took it. And then when we were leaving Jerusalem, when we were finishing up the program, we took it to the security officer and the, and the program coordinator, and we said, oh, we just thought you should have it here in Jerusalem. And they're like, why did you get this? Like, what do you mean? And we said, well, this is what happened. They both had tears in their eyes. These are two men that you would never see have tears in their eyes. They had tears in their eyes. They said, this has never happened. Your team made such an impact in this community that they gave you a plaque? And we're like, yeah, well, you know. <laughs> next, next photo. And then I'm just going to conclude with this. This little, this little dude was so cute. So there's the checkpoint that goes out to the Ibrahimi Mosque. And uh, this is Bet Salem, is one of the, it's an Israeli peace group. The regime of separation and violence has made life intolerable and commercial activity impossible for Palestinian residents. Day after day, year after year, this policy chips away at Palestinian communities in the area. Next slide. And this is my conclusion. I have, if you want to ask me questions, um, I ask that they would get a mic if you want to. But these are, if you want to learn more, um, on Instagram, there's code pink alert. Um, right now, they're doing a campaign to have Israeli citizens or Jewish people in the United States to not take a birthright trip. Isra State of Israel will give a two-week trip to Israel to show off Israel so that you can do Aliyah. And they're saying you don't see the fullness of the region through this birthright trip, so don't take it. So that's um, pink code alert. That's an Israeli or, or a Jewish um, 
group. Eye on Palestine is, I told you about that, the photographer. Uh, Breaking the Silence Israel, that's the, um, uh, on Instagram, that's the former Israeli military people telling their stories. CPT Palestine, community peacemaker teams. It used to be Christian peacemaker teams, but because it's not just Christians that are uh, volunteering, we worked very closely with them in Hebron. Um, new profile are those two women I just showed you, and Bet Salem. Uh, groups to follow their websites on Juppi. The United Church of Canada doesn't have a formal organization of um, ending, of working toward uh, ending the military occupation, but this is a United Church adjacent program, United Network for Justice and Peace in Palestine and Israel. No Way to Treat a Child builds on that, um, the uh, military court watch, like the children being detained. New Profile, Bet Salem, Community Peacemaker Teams, and Defense for Children International, uh, No Way to Treat a Child is, uh, they're trying to end child um, detainment. And then um, I put up WIAM, the Palestinian Conflict Transformation Center. They are a Christian organization right um, in Bethlehem, and they will, they'll take you into the state of Israel, they'll take you all over. Like they don't, it's not like they only just show you a select, you, you say, I want to go to the Sea of Galilee. I want to go to um, like some really historic Christian sites. Um, but yeah, so so this is where I'm done my former part of the presentation, and I'm happy to answer any questions. And if I can't answer them because I don't have the information, I'll get back to you. But if anybody has any questions, I'm hoping Chris will come around with a mic. Um, and feel free afterwards to come on up and take a look at my some of the souvenirs. There's no wood here because I've been to Israel a couple of times and I bought the, in Bethlehem. I got that other times. But I'll, the one thing I did get in Bethlehem was this little nativity set, and the wall is there. And there's a Banksy uh, piece of art on the wall. Um, uh, so anyway, I just the three wise men can't get through to the family because of the wall. So are, do you have any questions? We, we've talked about the Canadian government's stance on Israel and, and that we as Canadians need to be uh, more forthright about what's going on. And I want to thank you for what you've shared with us today, but also for giving of your time to go and to be a, a human rights um, observer. So thank you. Thank you. Chris, yeah, thank you. I just want to say that it is a very eye-opening presentation, and, and since you were there and you have documented it, so thank you very much for doing this, and uh, I learned a lot from this presentation, because what we read in general media, you know, whether social media or mainstream media, this is quite in detail, and it is hands-on, experience. Well, thank you very much for doing this thing. And I think it, it should open up everybody's eyes that where the conflict is and why it is not apartheid considered by, by our government while it is a very clear apartheid. What was in South Africa, it is maybe worse or maybe same. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, one thing I didn't say is one of the people that was in EA along with us um, in another team was a South African. And he, everybody kept looking at me when we talk about colonization and the outcome of colonization, and they would look at him when we talked about apartheid. I was the poster child for colonization. What, what are the outcomes of colonization? They'd be like, right, Canada? And I'd be like, yep, that's right. Hi, Anna Faye. Vicki, what happens to the reports that you write? They go from you to where? The World Council of Churches. And, and, they, and they distribute them to the UN, different organizations in the UN, and um, different uh, like peace, like activist groups, not activists, but um, groups that are working towards peace, to, like for statistics and, and, and stories. 
and so that they can share the stories um, and so it can be made real for uh, others to understand. Like when you're just saying, oh, you know, this area is under military occupation. No, it's, so they take our stories, our incidents and our stories and photos that we've taken and make it, make their own presentations as well. So it, they do go somewhere. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Um, what happened when you, when you put your vests or took your, took your vests off and you put them in your backpacks? Were you not afraid of them going through your backpacks and then finding them and then doing the same thing that they would have if, if you had them on? Yeah. Yeah, that's a risk we had to take. Yeah. They wouldn't challenge us very, like, very often. They, they would just say no to go through because they, they don't want to start an international incident either. Yeah. When the settlers were going through the market, yeah. um, did they purchase anything or was that honestly oh, just no. to stop the market and stop, okay. Oh no, they would never, that wouldn't yeah, ever okay. happen. Um, in fact, uh, not while I was there, but it, th there had been stories of the pots and stuff laying along the sides would get damaged. Um, like they would, you know, do a little, little kick every once in a while and that, but no. Uh, it, it was, that was not the intent. Supposedly the intent was, oh look, this is a holy site. Let me teach you about this holy site in the middle of the market. This, this hole in the wall represents something, something, something. So they'd all have to go look at it. Do you think they were like congregating, like making like, oh today is, sign up today to go. Oh yeah, no, they come from out of town. This, the, so you know how, uh, is it the oil sands or is it the tar sands? Right? Is it a settler incursion or is it a settler tour? Depending on who you are, you use different language, right? So for us, we refer to it as an incursion because that was not their area. Uh, but they would have people come from out of town, other settlements, and they would be all excited to see the hole in the wall. Thank you, Vicky. Um, it's my pleasure, like, whether that you should cover everything. It seems like we've been all, um, everything we've been through as you go, it seems like we are there, a uh, nice job. Um, have you encountered like uh, last uh, Ramadan, there was a break in in the mosque like uh, for last couple of years, it's going on. Yeah. Um, Baitul Maqsas Masjid, um, they had been um, blast and a lot of brutality in there, right? So have you noticed that thing there? So, uh, so there were no incidences in my time at the Ibrahimi Mosque because the thought was all the focus was happening in Jerusalem at the Alaska Mosque and the, Green, and the Golden Dome Mosque. In fact, if you'll remember, things were so bad that Lebanon sent rockets into Israel because they were so mad that um, the settlers and the military went into the mosque. So I didn't witness anything. Um, there was no... Um, offensive things happening during Ramadan while I was in Hebron. I don't know what happened. We left about halfway through. Let me tell you, being a Christian in a Muslim country during Ramadan was very, very special. Um, somebody's like, have you lost weight? And I'm like, well, you try being in, <laughs> in Hebron. You have COVID, and the day you get out of COVID is when uh, Ramadan starts, and you can't eat. You leave your house at 9, 30, 10 in the morning. You don't get back until 2 or 2.30. You don't want to eat a big meal because Sharin, your Muslim roommate, is fasting. And we have to have a big meal when she uh, has iftar at 6.10. 6.10. The food had to be ready, had to be on the table. So um, often I'd be walking and I'd be like, I'm so hungry. I'm so thirsty. And I'd want to say it out loud. And then I thought, everybody's hungry and everybody's thirsty. So suck it up. Um, but my experience of fasting, or what I know about fasting, particularly from a Catholic point of view, is that when you crave the thing that you're fasting from, you think of God. That's your mind is supposed to turn. So I did it as a spiritual practice. So every time I thought, oh, I'm hungry, I was like, hey. And I did that a lot between 10 and 2 p.m., uh, 10 and 3 p.m. And so I took it as a spiritual practice to be hungry and thirsty. Um, and uh, it, like I really, like I told Ali, it's like, oh, I never thought about um, 
fasting with you folks when you're fasting here in, in coming to the building in Ramadan. It didn't even occur to me. Um, but it didn't occur to me in Ramadan in Hebron that I could eat or drink. Nobody would fault me for it. I was clearly not Muslim, but we were in solidarity, so we didn't. And um, it was, it had a huge impact on me. And there's no celebration like Ramadan. Holy heck, they stay up so late. <laughs> there's so much celebration after 6.10 and after everybody's had their meal. And then they're visiting and partying and oh boy. It was, it was a really exciting time to be there. They didn't even change time. The Palestinian Authority wouldn't acknowledge time change because the West Bank, they didn't want to wait until 7.10 to eat, so they kept time. <laughs> So, so they could eat at 6.10, and then, which was confusing because the Israelis all switched time. So are you on Israeli time or are you on Palestinian time? We always had to ask. Vicky, could you please tell us a little more about the interesting electrical system? I'm sorry, the... I, the interesting electrical system. Oh, yeah. So um, you could only plug in two heaters at a time, and it would overload the circuits or something. It was so cold that we all sat in the living room, we had the gas heater on and two electrical heaters so we could create a circle of warmth and we all had blankets wrapped around us. Um, and then we would get ready for bed and we'd each take a heater and, and shut off everything else in the house so that our rooms would start to heat up. Um, but electrical systems in that area of the West Bank, I don't know what it's like elsewhere, you buy it on a card. You, you load up a card, and then you go to the electrical system outside your house and slide it in, and it gives it credits. So you buy credits. So 3 o'clock in the morning, if you've run out of credits, you have to go find the card, you have to go outside, you have to use your phone, find the slot, you always had to keep the card full. If you used the card, the first thing you did in the morning was go to the electrical shop and fill up the card because you never wanted to be without electricity. So yeah, it was fun. Our internet wasn't working. I, for, I hadn't paid the internet bill. I had to go find that shop, pay the bill. Uh, as you're thinking of other questions, uh, Hebron is known for its ceramics and making glass. So um, I bought more ceramics than this, but here's an example of the ceramics. Um, this um, vase, the colorful, the blue and green vase is Phoenician glass. Um, and then this is, this vase is the only, you can only buy it in one shop and it's it's got the bubbly paint, it's really awesome. Uh, this glass was made in Hebron and then sent to Gaza for painting and they paint it with a chemical process. Um, and then there, it's also, Hebron's also known for the cross stitching, so I've got the two pillowcases and little um, coasters. And then at the women's shop, uh, our house was filled with these, we had about eight of these, uh, they were practice ones. Um, men can do something, Women can do anything. So every woman that came, to the sh t came and stayed in our house got one of these. Um, these scarves were given to us by, you know, different organizations. I had to mail all of, I had to mail this kind of stuff home because if I went through the airport and they saw it, they'd confiscate it. So my vest had to be mailed home. There's a question here. Uh, this is my Arabic book learning Arabic, all my notes in it. I took Arabic twice a week. And these are my prayer stones. First full day in Hebron, I'm telling you, the day ended with me walking home, one in each hand. The congregation each prayed over these stones, and I, I just I cried and prayed all the way home. I had been hit by a car. I had lost my vest. I, um, something else had happened. That boy almost hit me with a rock. And I was like, what in God's name have I gotten myself into? And I'm like, <laughs> and I pulled out my prayer stones. <laughs> and, I and then I was fine. Um, Hi. Where did you get the, the black and white patterned like, fabric on the table? Oh, like these scarves? This scarf? Um, yeah, the patterned one. 
Yeah, so they Black both have that pattern on them. One I got from HRD, which is where we got those plaques from. And this other one, well, I don't know that I want to tell you this, but on our last night all together in Jerusalem, when our, when our tasks, when we're all done and we're free of the program, there is a bar next to the guest house. <laughs> we weren't allowed to drink. And you couldn't in Hebron. I don't even think there's a liquor store in Hebron. Um, and so when you were on days off, you might have gone to the EA bar, we called it. And the fellow that ran the bar gave us, gave us those So while we were dancing. <laughs> Um, so that's one of the first questions they ask me, it, would I go back? Um, with the United Church of Canada, they want to know if I'll go on a list because United Church of Canada has funding to take, send two EAs a year. Sweden wins the EA test or uh, contest. They have eight go, the Norwegians had seven. Oh, the Swede network was great because there's Swedes in all the teams and you'd be like, oh, that team is fighting. Um, Shrin, text the Swede in that group and find out what's going on. Um, but Canada, United Church of Canada can only send two. And so they put people who are willing to go back on a list. And there have been, like the fellow that's there right now has, was there this time last year. And I said no. I said no, because I will go back. I would be happy to lead a group. If we can get a group of us together, I'd be happy to go back in that situation. Um, this sounds all sentimental, uh, but 90 days was, that was, something I really wanted to do. I knew it was going to be hard. I knew, I knew it was going to be difficult. I went through four months of interviews and physical assessment, uh, mental assessment, like I had an extensive application process. But 90 days is a long time to be away from the people that you love. And I think I've done what I can. And I think that I would like to spend my time advocating, going on tours, but not that 90-day commitment. It, it was, um, I was very grateful for the internet and WhatsApp. So the only day that I didn't connect with my spouse was on a day that he couldn't talk early in the morning because I would talk in, when it was his morning and my evening, the way the time went. I was able to connect with all of our family calls. We have family calls every Sunday, every Sunday. I was able to connect with them every week. So, um, so that was great. Um, in fact, when I got off the plane in Toronto and Chris met me, I had nothing more to tell him. Like, I had been telling him all the stories all along. Like, none of this is new for him. He might not have seen the photos, but none of this is really new. But 90 days is a long time. Oh, so I actually only able, so what did I do with my nine days off? I only took, only, took eight days off because of COVID. Um, you, get, you get five nights paid for in a guest house by the organization. You get, if you get organized, you can stay three nights up in Tiberias in the state of Israel at the Sea of Galilee. Uh, that's by the uh, Church of Scotland gives an apartment to EAs, and you can go there. So I got that organized, I had it all nicely set, and then I got COVID the week that I was supposed to go. So, I, so Ian went on my holiday without me. Um, not bitter about that at all. And we get an allowance, uh, we get an allowance, and I was determined to stay within my allowance. Uh, I, I couldn't quite, but I tried. So I didn't go, I didn't pay for the last night. I probably could have figured it out if I wanted to. So I had the five nights, so I spent two nights. We could be away up to three nights in a row, but the ideal was two nights. So went to Bethlehem in a, a, a Catholic auberge, it's called, and it's basically a monastery. Um, and then two nights in uh, the old city of Jerusalem and then two nights in a, just outside of the old city walls. Um, and that's six. I don't know what I did with my, I don't know what I did. I must have, I've forgotten. But um, uh, it, it was hard the last part of it because it was during Ramadan and there's nowhere to eat. And so then I uh, would make sure I take food with me and, and that because you try getting in the way of a group of Muslims who want to eat at 7.10. 
And I'd be like, oh, this isn't my fight, right? And so I just, so my days off, I just went into a guest house and I just turtled right in and I stayed, I cross-stitched a lot and, and watched movies and stuff, yeah. I didn't tour because I had been, I had been twice and, and seen that. You said the first day you got hit by a car? Oh yeah, it, it's not that big of a deal, but I did get knocked a little bit. Like I was walking towards, I was walking down that road towards 56, CP 56, and the car took me out from the side, and yeah, there was just a few tears. It was okay. <laughs> I, I, I started paying more attention to my surroundings. It was really overwhelming the first day, right? Like there's just so much happening, and you're taking off your vest and putting it on, and anyway, it was fine. The United Church of Canada did a check-in. They, they called me every week because I was in Hebron. Um, nobody else gets the phone calls like that, but, oh, you're in Hebron, we need to talk to you. And she says, how about you call us the same day you get hit by a car next time? I'm like, okay. <laughs> All right, <laughs> if you insist. So, um, yeah. So, um, I am available at any time for questions. I am happy to do... Uh, you got my very long presentation. That's because you're you. Um, I am going to work to get this presentation down so I can take it on the road or do it by Zoom and stuff. But if you have any thoughts of uh, other organizations that might want to hear the story or find out some information, I'm happy to do that. And that's part of my work. I might be going to Ottawa in the fall to speak to the Foreign Affairs Committee as they're doing work on um, uh, find, uh, working on peace. I, I'm not going to say anything more than that, because I, I don't know exactly what's going on, uh, who will be invited to speak, but the United Church of Canada is, wants the person who's there right now and me to go and speak to the Foreign Affairs Committee. And um, the United Church of Canada also wants me to come and talk to the moderator and the General Secretary of the United Church of Canada as we figure out, as the church figures out what principle-based justice looks like. Because at the last General Council, no decisions were made on um, Israel-Palestine because they wanted to set a framework in which we would then advocate for peace and justice. So, so they're trying to create that framework and they want me to be involved in uh, basically giving testimony and then they can take that information. So it's part of the advocacy work. Thank you so much for being here this afternoon.